Hello folks and welcome back to Medieval Total War. I am Kana Step, and today I will be playing the Viking Invasion expansion pack for this game. For those of you who have been uh, subscribed to my channel for a while and have been watching my videos, I want to have a quick word just to kind of give you a little bit of an update on my channel. I will be continuing uh, to play the Aragon campaign. Uh, as you probably know, I've just been so busy with work that I haven't really had uh, haven't really had any chance to record any gameplay. So you might be wondering why am I starting a new campaign right now for the Viking Invasion Expansion Pack on this day? Well, today, May 7th of 2023, is the 20th anniversary of this of this campaign. So I initially did want to upload this video on the day, you know, the 20th anniversary. Unfortunately, I just will be recording this video on May 7th. I just have not had the time. So I this video will be like a day late or so. I'm not quite sure when I will be uploading it, but yeah, that's the idea there. Um, I will be finishing my Aragon campaign, so don't you worry about that. But I just wanted to get this video recorded and uh, then I can start working on it. So for those of you who are new to this uh, channel, welcome. I am Connor Step, and I play Total War games. Now, I have been essentially celebrating the 20th anniversary of each game in succession, starting with Shogun 1. And I am diving into these games essentially with no nostalgia, no previous experience. I did not grow up playing these games. I kind of discovered them through YouTube uh, quite a few years ago, um, and I just kind of watched them on YouTube for the longest time before I finally started to play them myself. And by that, I mean, I wanted to basically record my journey through exploring these games. Now, that does not mean that I'm coming into these recordings completely fresh. I do try to get a little bit of experience into the game just so that I'm not, you know, you know, I'm jumping. I know I kind of know what I'm doing a little bit when I do dive into these recordings in these campaigns. So that is the idea here. And yeah, that is why I'm recording uh, this on this day, you know, for the 20th anniversary of the Viking invasion expansion. And I'm really excited about this campaign because to me looking at it and I, now I gotta say, I've not had a ton of experience with this campaign again, just because I have been busy. But uh, my, my understanding is that this kind of feels like a combination of Medieval Total War and Shogun Total War because it does obviously have the setting, the medieval European setting. And um, but it, but it has, you know, that small scale feel of, of Shogun, you know, fighting over essentially just a couple of islands amidst a couple of um, very closely related cultural factions, you know, just like in Shogun, uh, we have it here on the British Isles. And it, it, there's some similarities there, right? And it feels kind of nice because with Medieval, at least my preferred play style is to kind of really immerse myself in how big the game is. And um, a part of that leads me to really slow down my gameplay and really um, kind of dive into the world building a little bit. I don't try to just kind of go out and take over the entire map because I, I don't find that fun maybe for one campaign that will be fun but for the original medieval campaign in this game i think it's more fun to play the glorious achievements mode and to um yeah just play it a little bit just a little bit of role playing there you know i i that's that's more fun for me however with shogun it, it was a map conquest map domination type of game that's essentially the only real play way to play the game and that is the uh, victory conditions for the Viking Invasion Expansion Pack. So it does share some similarities in that regard. And in that sense, I'm I'm looking forward to this. I, like I said, have had some experience. Just a little bit kind of diving in to the Viking Invasion uh, map and kind of getting my bearings, exploring the tech tree a little bit. It seems pretty limited compared to the tech tree in the medieval base game. And the unit rosters themselves seem pretty um, limited as well. So for the Irish themselves, let's just kind of dive in here, play on expert difficulty. And yes, there is just one victory condition, which is dominate and conquer all of the provinces. And yes, I will be playing the Vikings. And I guess I could read this. Might be kind of long, but if you, <laughs> if you want to fast forward, you can just uh, skip ahead. In 793 AD, Britain is not a country. It is not even an idea of a country yet. It is a patchwork of competing petty kingdoms left behind after the departure of the last of Rome's legions. The Roman Empire did not fall in Britain. It packed up and went home, leaving the locals to sort out their own problems. 
In 410 AD, the Emperor Honorius sent the Romano-British a polite letter telling them to look at look to their own uh, defenses. Um, this was the only help he could offer to defend against the invading Saxons. A hundred years earlier, the last of the truly great emperors, Constantine, had been proclaimed emperor in northern Britannia at Aboricum, but now Britannia and its people were truly alone in a hostile world. The distant corners of the British Isles had never even been a part of the empire. Ireland and most of what would be a Scotland had never been under Roman authority. The Romano-British did their best to thrive, of course, but the Roman province fragmented and then split again into smaller kingdoms under pressure from invaders and local warlords. Saxons from the European mainland took much of the south coastal region, completely overrunning the Roman forts of the Saxon shore that were supposed to keep them out. Under semi-legendary leaders like King Arthur, the Britons fought back, but the Anglo-Saxons were in Britain to stay. Even Christianity withered as Ro Roman Britain was forgotten and overrun. Pushed aside by pagan gods, invaders didn't just come from the east either. The Picts in the far north were driven inland by Scots clans from Ireland. The reinvasion by Christianity took time. The Pope sent missionaries, but each king in turn had to be persuaded and converted. In the meantime, by 600, around half of Britain was ruled by Anglo-Saxon kings, and they claimed to be overlords of much of the rest. The time was one when warlords could thrive, extending their kingdoms at the expense of neighbors who would then hold a grudge forever, if not slightly longer. From time to time, a warlord arose who was powerful enough to be recognized as the Bretwalda, the High King of Britain, but this was merely a, a title rather than the reality of power. Um, but not all was grim. By late 700s, the great King of Mercia, Offa, not only built a huge earthwork to keep the Welsh at bay, but also minted the first coins seen since the Romans departed. He was a king as mighty as any in Europe. But there was a cloud on the horizon, over the icy eastern seas. By any standards, the year of our Lord, 793, did not begin well for the king and people of Northumbria. The northern region... Let's see, I'm getting lost here. The northern neighbors uh, to Mercia... The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle reported events many years later. There were terrible portents that miserably frightened the people. Lightning, storms, and fiery dragons were seen in the skies. Then famine struck, and the people weakened, sickened, and died. They must have felt that God's grace had passed them by for some reason. The years showed few signs of getting better when, in early summer, a new devil reappeared. From out of the east, a new threat came to them, axe armed and savage. In dragon-carved ships, rapacious, wolves among sheep, the Vikings. These few raiders fell upon the monastery at Lindisfarne, one of the oldest centers of Christian learning in northern Europe, and having slaughtered the monks, took all of the treasures they could carry and vanished back out to sea. They would be back in greater numbers, and Britain would never be the same again. Let's continue, and I'm sure I have to read the same amount of stuff for the Irish themselves. So yeah, uh, Ireland, believe it or not, is gonna, or the Irish, believe it or not, are gonna start on the uh, the island named Ireland. So we have a few starting units here, uh, three kerns. I will get more into what these units uh, mean when I get into the campaign map itself. Faction difficulty rating hard. That's interesting because they are rather isolated from the rest of the factions, um, being kind of on their own own island. The Scots, I do believe, uh, own one of the provinces, but it's really easy to push them out, and then rebels hold the other provinces, I believe. So, it's it's a fairly it's it's interesting actually. I, I kind of compare the Irish in some ways to the Shimazu in the Shogun campaign, where they start on um, with uh, most most of a domination of their own island, in um, Shogun that being Kyushu, and they just kind of consolidate their own island and they can push out from there into the mainland, or the or the main you know island. And yeah, very similar, I guess. You know, they even have the same faction color being green for both the Irish and the Shimazu. And even I, I, in some ways, like the, um, the, the, the philosophical mindset of, of waging war for the Shimazu, you know, and the Irish have kind of a similar lightly armored, heavy hitting sort of a, um, idea behind it. So there are some similarities here. It's kind of fun to, to see that in play. So I just based on my initial understanding of this campaign, it seems like the Irish can, 
uh, conquer their own, their own island uh, fairly easily. And then push out when they're ready, although pushing out faster is probably for the best. Because these southern um, British factions can get very strong very quickly and get these very, very good heavy infantry units called these um, house cows. Now the Irish have a very unique army, which I think might be attributed to the hard difficulty rating. The Irish army does lack archers, but they do have three different types of javelin units, which um, each have their own strengths and weaknesses. And I will talk more about the faction roster as I get into the campaign again, but I wanted to just kind of guess as to why this is rated as hard. Because for my lack of experience on this Viking invasion campaign, I did put quite a few hours into custom battles with the Irish armies trying to figure that out and trying to find out what makes them tick. And I feel like I have an idea of how to use them and, and I am excited to show them to you all. So in any case, let's get into this. Uh, faction difficulty, yep, yep, yep. Uh, playing the Irish is equivalent to a harder difficulty starting or setting than the basic one you chose. Protected by the sea that divides it from the largest of the British Isles, Ireland was never a Roman province. The importation of Christianity has had a profound effect on its native Celtic culture. But by and large, Ireland has kept to itself relying on the sea as a defense and mounting only occasional sea raids against Wales and the west of England. The migration of the Dalreda and the resulting creation of Scotland was an isolated event, and so far, no other Irish people has followed their example. However, the English already cast covetous eyes on Wales and Scotland. It can only be a matter of time before they try to add Ireland to their realms. Braver still is the threat of the Vikings, to whom the sea is the whale road rather than a barrier. The Irish can no longer count on living in peace, but must prepare to fight long and hard against foreign enemies. If not for the conquest of other lands, than in the defense of their own. A strategy of making Ireland an expensive and bloody place to invade can be a worthwhile first step towards eventual, eventual domination, using the warriors created for defense to carry the attack overseas. A strong king leading a united, united Ireland has a number of options, all of which rely on some sea power. If Wales can be taken while the Welsh, Saxon, Saxons, <laughs> Saxons and the rest are distracted, Ireland can establish itself as a power on the British mainland. The Scots have also shown one invasion route from Ireland into the Western Lowlands. If they can do it, perhaps the Irish can follow. The Vikings will have to take the Scottish Isles and part of the North to make a permanent and complete conquest of Ireland. Feasible, but if Ireland takes these provinces first, or looks to its own defenses if this proves impossible, the Vikings' plans can be stalled, and perhaps a unified Celtic Empire can be established. Interesting. Okay, so there are some attack options available once Ireland itself is secured. I myself was looking at going south and taking out the southern factions just because I do think they look to be the strongest. Just looking at their roster. But with that being said, I do think that the the light infantry that's focused on javelins counters the heavy infantry very well. That's 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 kind of the natural counter, right? Um Heavy infantry can oftentimes hold out against cav, uh, you know, depending on the circumstances. But light infantry can oftentimes tear heavy infantry apart. So uh, in that regard, I think that there is a good counter there. However, the fact that the Irish did not have any long range skirmishers, we do not have archers. So the fact that we do not have archers is quite a weakness. It really is. It kind of kind of forces your hands into certain circumstances. And it makes the Irish not really great at defending because... What's the point of like, you know, hanging out and corner camping on a hill when your neck can't rain death, you know, down upon them? Obviously, you still want hills, but I'm just saying, you know, I, archers and hills are a fantastic combination. Without further ado, let's just kind of jump on into this campaign. Stop staring at this uh, little map here in the screen. And I think actually now that I've done this, I think I can turn the volume up because I just had the volume turned down for the menu just because the monks chanting although it's pretty sweet it's pretty cool it can be a little bit loud when i'm trying to record so uh options and audio and just bump this up to 35 is fine now we're ready okay let's check it out so 
just immediately it's it's a much more bare bones map than the actual like medieval campaign right it's for me very pleasing on the eye actually i gotta say it's it's kind of peaceful to look at the uh the original medieval campaign map can be a little bit t uh, tedious dare i say to look at when you're used to the the elegant simplicity of shogun itself so obviously we do have the titles the uh, the titles that are attached to the provinces themselves that are going to grant someone the title of governor of each province which will essentially you know either boost the income or the population loyalty or what have you those are the two main things but for let's see i think so this is gonna be my capital essentially of brega and what can i get if i give someone the governorship of brega they will have one plus one loyalty and then plus one acumen plus one dread and then plus one command oh and by the way i um i do like to essentially talk about these campaigns as if you the viewer um don't know too much about the game so uh, if 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 that's a little tedious for you i'm sorry but i do like to ex explain a lot of these things I, I do like to take my time with this so um if i once like once i've had maybe three four five campaigns on viking invasion maybe i'll move a little bit faster but in the beginning i'd like to take my time and look at things and look at the buildings look at the you know tech trees and all that stuff and and you know take take me with you because uh, or I'm sorry, yeah, take you with me because sometimes I feel like it can be easy to get left behind if reviewing these campaigns and the narrator isn't taking the time to really describe things. So as we can see here, I do have these two provinces on the island of Ireland, and we have rebels here in Munster and Connacht, and then the Scots on Ulster. So I will be saving them for last. I think the play is, what do I have here in, so this is my king. Let's take a look at him first. So he's a three star leader. Each command star is going to be giving. So this is, <laughs> I've, I've had um, almost two and a half years to figure out the best way to describe this because this is the same system used in Shogun. But for each command star, or sorry, for each two command stars is going to add plus one valor, which is essentially like unit experience. It's going to add plus one valor to every unit, uh, every friendly unit on the battlefield. So you might be wondering, what is the odd numbers? Like, was was it matter if you have three stars rather than two? Well, for each one star, that's going to give plus one valor to uh, units that are closer to your king. Not everyone on the battlefield, but just the ones that are closer to your king. So if he had uh, four stars, he would be offering plus two valor to every friendly soldier uh, on the battlefield. And then he'd be offering plus four valor to people that within, I think it's a 50 meter radius, like with, around him, I think is my guess. I think I heard that at some point, but yeah, it's a, it's a huge, huge boost. Um, adding valor as plus one attack, plus one defense, and then plus two morale for each unit, which is, which is just monumental. That's an enormous, enormous buff. So command is very important for your leaders and uh, vices and virtues. Oh yeah. Look at this. So skilled attacker. So he will have plus one attack. I'll read this to you. He's particularly skilled in directing attacks in the field, plus one command when attacking. So this is going to go up to four stars if he attacks someplace, which is very, very nice. He is 35 years old and he is also married, which is what this shows here. And this is the king. It shows that here. And this is like a gold sword and his sons will have like a silver sword. So there's only going to be the one gold sword. That's for the king himself. Influence. What does it mean? Well, Influence kind of denotes um, his diplomatic power amongst the other leaders that he's dealing with. And <clears throat> essentially, there's, there's a few things that I understand about this. And by the way, there's plenty of gaps in my knowledge with this game. Not just with this campaign, but this game itself. And there's a lot that's not quite um, ex explicitly stated. And I've had to kind of either guess at it or really, really dig into the forums and a lot of the discussions that people had in the forums when they were playing this game 20 years ago, a lot of that was guesswork as well. So trying to find definitive answers to my questions has been pretty difficult. So I don't want to just throw a bunch of guesses at you, but unfortunately there's going to be a little, a little bit of that here. Influence. What do I know exactly that it does? Or like for sure that it does? Well, it influences my general's loyalty. If the influence goes too low, then my general's loyalty will lower, and there's going to be a chance of a civil war happening. What else does it really affect? Well, I believe that it affects my ability to get um, ceasefires and 
um, allies with other, other factions. And then as far as the guessing goes, some people have guessed that influence uh, has to do with how good your heirs are going to be or how good your generals are going to be stats wise when they come into you know power or when they come of age. I don't really think that's true. I don't think that's true. I, I don't think there's a ton of bearing of the king's stats and that being passed down onto his sons or the generals. I really could be wrong though. I just, I, I'm tempted to think that there is a faction hard coding in this because that there, there was that in Shogun as well. Shogun followed a, a faction hard coding where certain factions would get, you know, more generals based on their historical generals uh, than other factions. And that was a part of the faction balance. Certain factions had more heirs, other factions did not, and this was a hard-coded thing. It was not random, you know. And in medieval, the the heirs themselves uh, in medieval total war, the heirs and such, and the royalty, they're they're not exactly historically linked. There are historical generals that can get a little bit awkward because sometimes the historical general can actually be the leader of that faction historically. Um, but they will pop out and you will see like, oh, hey, who's this? And you'll kind of like, for me, since I don't know a ton about history, you'll kind of like uh, Google them and kind of look them up and see like, oh, shit, that's, that's you know, so-and-so. Um, but then it, the question becomes, is there more to it than that? Is it is there more, do they add more than just historical generals? Do they make it so that certain factions just tend to have better leaders? Or is it really linked to the stats of your king? I'm not sure. So I'm not really convinced uh, that the influence has to do with how good your heirs are, but I very, very well could be wrong. It could maybe influence, uh, you know, has to do with that, or maybe command stars has to do with that. I'm not sure. Piety, what is it? Also kind of confusing. <laughs> Piety has more to do, in my opinion, a religion, or my understanding is that religion doesn't play a huge factor in the Viking invasion campaign. So I'm not going to talk too much about it, but piety, well, yeah, so piety has to do with, um, I'm pretty sure it matches up with the zeal of a province. So zeal, like if, if the faction, um, hmm, how do I explain this? So if the faction's like main uh, religion, which in here, I think we're all Catholic, but you know, the, in the base game, there's Catholics and there's Orthodox and there's Muslims. But essentially, if uh, you're the province that you're invading has a religion that matches up with your own religion, then having a governor govern that new province that has high piety, as long as there's high zeal in that province, that's going to raise the population loyalty of that province. So if I invade Munster, you know, what are they? They are, um, yes, they have Catholic, 86% Catholic. 7% uh, pagan, and then 7% heretics, or heretical cults, essentially. So yes, majority Catholic. How is your zeal? 47%. So possibly, I'm guessing that having uh, super high piety is not going to be a big deal for invading Munster when it comes to trying to keep that population loyalty high. That's my that's my guess there. Now, the reverse is also true, true but this is, see I'm, get, see, I'm getting into the base game here. But when you're invading a faction or a province that does not have um, the religion match up with yours, say you're a Catholic faction invading a Muslim faction, then you kind of are looking for, I, I think it's like low zeal. If you want, yeah, it's low zeal, and then you want like a low piety governor, I think. I think that's how that works. And then you'll have better population loyalty. I think. And that's, you know, again, please correct me. Please, please, please correct me. Getting into the easier stats to describe. Dread is simple. Dread just increases the population loyalty of a province. That's it. There's no battlefield application. It does not cause fear in enemy troops on the battlefield. It just makes the people fall in line a little bit easier. So in general, if you're having a province, you know, if you're having difficulty keeping a province loyal, the easier way to deal with it is having a good, uh, a high dread governor. And then piety is kind of like the extra thing that I, Probably should start looking at more so, but probably not in this campaign, honestly. I've already described command. It literally just has to do with 
uh, Battlefield com Command. Now, it has nothing to do with the strategy map or the campaign map itself. And Acumen is also very simple. It has to do with uh, how much money your provinces are making. The Acumen of your governors obviously just influ influences the uh, income of that specific province up to a higher degree than your king's influence or, you know, Acumen does. The king's Acumen is going to essentially affect every province in his domain to a certain degree. I don't know what, what the percentage is. It's like, a, you know, like 2% or 3% or something very low like that. But it's spread out to all of the provinces under his control, obviously. And same with Dread. Dread works same way, the same way for the king. The individual province, um, province governors, Dread has a bigger direct influence on the population loyalty, whereas the king's Dread will spread that population loyalty, you know, throughout his entire realm. Vices and Virtues, I've already talked to you about his. He just has the one Vice and Virtue, and he will gain more as he goes along here. And hopefully he can start... Let's look at my family line here. So I do have two princes on the way. Prince Aid and a Prince Donchad. One is 14, one is 8. So they will come of age when they're 16, so two more years before Prince Aid is of age. So if my king <laughs> dies in the next two turns, then game over. That's That's how it works. So hopefully that does not happen. And yes, I do have a princess on the way as well. And she's going to be a very useful prince, uh, Aifa. And I will be using her to try to secure a an alliance with the Vikings right away. They're going to be my top, top priority is securing an alliance with the Vikings. Because if I can not worry about them at all, and I can focus simply on taking out the, the British people, that's going to make things a little bit easier for me. That's going to be my main goal, right? Consolidate consolidating the island, getting an alliance with the Vikings, and then putting boats in the water. Because if I can have boats in each of these regions surrounding my island, then the Vikings would have to destroy my boats before they can attack me, which would give me a turn of warning before that happens. So it's like my first line of defense. Now, the Viking Navy is better than my Navy, and they they can probably beat me as long, you know, unless I like outnumbered them by quite a bit. But still, just having that first line of defense is going to be helpful with, um, you know, preparing for any eventual attack. I do have a bishop here. And since, as I stated, I th think we are all Catholic ex except for the Vikings who are pagan. I think that's the case. So his ability to spread the Catholic religion is not going to really have any point. But he is essentially an emissary. He can also be used to try to get that alliance with the uh, Vikings, even though he is of a different religion than them. That's not going to matter. He can be used as an emissary in that regard. So he will be useful in that sense. He can also be useful as a spy, you know, being able to check out other regions and see what they're up to. Like um, for now, like I could go into Munster and see what units they have, but I'm probably going to invade Munster right away. So maybe I can go up to Connect instead and see. Oh, no, I can't <laughs> I have to. I have to go to Brega first, I suppose. Yeah, whatevs. That's fine. And then what do we have here? So, like, let's talk about my units, I suppose. My royal bodyguards is going to be my bodyguard unit for my king. Something that I really like about medieval as opposed to shogun is that all of the royalty, the heirs and the kings, they all get their own bodyguard, they mounted bodyguard units, which are units of heavy cavalry. They felt a little bit stupid in shogun where you had to really time out the coming of age of your heirs to make sure they appear in the right units. That just felt really necessary, yes, but like stupid. It felt really dumb if you messed up and you just kind of forgot for one turn and you had like a really, you know, high level heir, you know, show up in a unit of Ashigaru. That felt so stupid. It felt so bad. It felt so bad. And um, it's really nice that just everyone in this game just comes of age and they're already leading a unit of heavy cav. Now, the royalty units of heavy cav are going to be less uh, in number in numbers in men than the actual like full full scale units of heavy cav. Something that I like about medieval uh, as opposed to shogun is that in shogun every unit is 60 man, whereas the units in this game are d of different sizes. So the royal bodyguard units are 20 man units or 21 men in the case of a king's unit because he has 20 men guarding him. But then the full sized Cavalry units will be 40 men, right? Uh, basic infantry units will have 60 men in it. You'll see the number of men right here. 
or just right here in the top left corner, it'll also show you down here the unit card, how many men this unit has in it. Um, spearmen have a hundred men in it to try to make them more of a resilient unit. You know, they're more of like a mainland mainline defensive unit. Uh, what else? I think that's about it. 60, 100, 20, 40. And then like there's a few specialty you know considerations as well. But those are the main ones here. Then what units do I actually have? Well, other than my heavy cav unit of royal bodyguards that my king has, I also have a unit of Irish Dartmen. This is one of my javelin units. Darts, actually light javelins, are a weapon of great antiquity in Ireland, used by the heroes of the epic tales as well as lesser warriors. Whilst not as deadly as arrow fire, a shower of darts can disrupt many ill-disciplined units. And uh, yeah, very weak defense, fast, poor morale. And then yeah, the unit leader, Donnell the Wise, has his own stats, as you can see. And, and that's um, what you basically assign as governors to your regions, is your unit captains themselves can each become their own characters, essentially. Which is pretty cool. It's kind of a neat thing that was added in this game. And then Kearns. So, the Irish keep to the Celtic way of warfare. Constant skirmishing between Irish warlords and English invaders gives even the peasants a warlike attitude. They fight as Kearns, light, harassing javelin men, rather than as untrained farm laborers, and bring a particularly bloody-minded savagery to the battlefield. Now, Kearns and Irish javelin men are very, very similar units. In fact, their stats are completely identical. It's kind of confusing. There are some differences though that change the way that each of these units are used. For one thing, Irish Dartmen do have a small shield. It's not in this picture here, which is one of the reasons why it's confusing. It's also not displayed anywhere here. To find out stats about the units in this game, I use a website. I go to the org, which is like the Total War uh, org forums. And I literally have them open on my other two monitors so that I can see and compare unit stats while I'm playing this game. It's kind of laborious, but I just, they, they didn't put them in, the, they're not, I don't know, 20 years ago, they were like, I don't know, game de uh, developers were like, ah, it's fine. They don't, they don't need stats for the units. It's fine. So why are starving? Like, what's the deal? They do have it. They do have a light shield. A light shield is going to add plus one to their defense. And then um, it's also going to add uh, plus one to their armor. And um, so armor is essentially going to block range attacks. And the defense is going to help with their hand-to-hand uh, -hand, uh, ability to defend themselves. And so that, you know, you'd think makes them like better than Kearns, right? Well, there's uh, it's not quite, you know, I'm not finished. There's a difference in their ranged uh, attacks as well. So Irish dartmen. It's darts, not javelins, but they're very similar. Darts are not as powerful as javelins. Javelins, um, and, the, and now this is where I'm like looking at my my monitors right now. So javelins do have they're they're super lethal. You know they're they're like four times as lethal as as a uh, arrow arrow fire, and um, they're pretty good at beating down heavy heavy infantry and heavy cav as well. But there's only going to be four javelins for any javelin armed unit, whereas the dartmen are going to carry seven darts. And their darts will have a bit more range on them, but it's still not as much as archers. Archers still have twice as much rain, range as dartmen. So don't think you can go toe-to-toe -to -toe in a range deal with uh, um, archers. That's not the case. However, because they do have higher range than your other javelin men, Irish dartmen can be used in addition, as well as you know having a little shield. They're a decent screening force that can be used in their loose formation, so they're harder to hit as individual units, with their small shields, they can kind of soak up that arrow fire ahead of your main formation a little bit better than Kearns can. And Kearns, with their higher damage javelins, can do a better job at actually withering down heavy infantry. That's a really good role for your Kearns to have. Now, you might think that because Irish Dartman have that shield, it's just the better unit for melee combat as well. Well, that's not quite true. Down here, if we look at the province of Legan, it's gonna say right here that historically, this region was famous for its kerns. Units of this type trained here gain a plus one valor bonus. And that's that. You're pretty much gonna be training, or I pretty much will be training kerns exclusively from the province of Legan. 
because that plus one valor, remember, is going to give me plus one attack, plus one defense, and plus two morale. That is huge. That's so, that's so much. That is so much. And that immediately makes any Kern that is trained from Lagan a superior unit to the Irish Dartman in, in a melee fight. Um, so yeah, that's that's that. So you might think like, what's what's the point of the of the, the Irish Dartman then? Like, what, why even use them? I think there is value in in having a light screening force. I think that that is a useful thing to have. In addition to that, I will set these guys to skirmish mode so that if I can kind of sucker the enemy into charging my quote unquote weak center, my uh, Dartman will retreat behind my lines. And having that just additional range will help them throw their darts from behind my lines while staying safe. Whereas the range on javelins is short. It's very short. So it can be a little bit tricky to get them, you know, in position where they're safe, but they can still throw their javelins. Whereas dart means a bit easier. It, you can kind of like, there's a little bit more leeway there. So they are easier to use in that way. So that is kind of the differences between these units and how I will be using them. And yeah, I know I'm, I know I'm, this is long winded, but this is how I like to do things. So apologies. And yeah, down here, I think it's so, yeah, I just have a Dartman and a Kern and then my Royal Bodyguard. I didn't read this. So the Royal Bodyguard forms the heart of the most Royal armies in times of war. Few units are as well trained as well equipped or as deadly on the battlefield. They're expensive and few number, but used wisely. They can be the key to victory. Yes. Then up here in Braga, I just have a unit of Irish Darkman and then two units of Kerns as well. Oh yeah, and also, let's see, support cost between the two units is uh, identical, so 15. However, Irish Darkman do cost 25 more Florins to train than Kerns, which is another interesting little facet. I believe it's, can I train both? Yes, I can. So Kerns cost 125 to train, and then the Darkman costs 150, so... Yeah, a little, a little bit of a difference there, which is, yeah, it makes it makes the Kerns seem like a really good deal, which which they are. And I think that that in general, I think that the Irish troops are pretty cheap, but I, I have not played with the other factions, so I can't really compare them. Now, I immediately can, I, and I just noticed this, so I can train other units immediately from turn one here in Brega. Kerns and then, yeah, Gallo Glasses. This is going to be the fun one here, and this is a really cool unit. In some ways, Ireland is a relic of earlier times. Gallo glasses are Celtic warriors armed with two-handed swords. They are loyal to a clan chieftain, swift and fierce in battle, and enter an almost berserk-like frenzy. They also are reputed to take the heads of slain enemies as trophies. See, Shimazu, just going back, just going back to Japan. Uh, anyway, yeah. So as it says, they um they carry two-handed swords. They do have a armor-piercing attack or bonus versus armor. It's not in these games in medieval. It's not like the newer Total War games where armor piercing actually negates armor the way they did it in this game is really awkward and i will try my best to explain it to you bonus versus armored troops that's literally what they did with this game uh, for units that have bonus versus armored like axe units or you know two-handed sword units or uh, mace units i think as well I, I can't remember if there's any mace units in the base game but what they did was when these units are fighting uh, another unit say a unit that has an armor rating of four, it's going to take half of that armor rating and add it to the attack value of, of the armor, the bonus versus armored uh, unit. So this Gala class unit, if it's fighting a unit that had an armor rating of four and just say, um, let me actually pull it up here real quick. So a Gala glass has an attack value of five. And if they're fighting that unit with an armor value of four, they're going to get a plus two, uh, to their attack value. So they'll be attacking that unit with an attack value of seven, which is quite good. And that's how this works. Now, what's funny is that the more elegant system of armor piercing that is used in the newer Total War games, that's exactly how the ranged units in this game work. So it's not like CA just like couldn't figure it out. They did it differently with the gun units and the longbow units and the crossbow units. They all have armor modifiers which essentially takes off of armor, takes armor off when, you know, they're uh, shooting at those uh, armored units, it, which is just, it's just really silly. It's really, really silly. It's its weird to think that these units, the axes and stuff, aren't cutting through the armor. 
So even though they have a higher a chance of hitting the units because they're getting higher attack values, which is good, there's they still have to get through that high level of armor, which isn't a trip. You know, that's not the case at all with this uh, with the way it works in this game. You're not piercing any of that armor essentially, which is just really awkward. But anyway, for whatever. That's 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 his own thing. Gallo glasses are still a great shock troop to use against armored units. They will be used as can openers against the heavy house carls of the um, the, the the British factions. What else do we have? Peasants, not really, m nothing really to them. Life is never easy for peasants on the bottom rung of a very long social ladder. When war comes, the levy takes them away from home and their crops. They're given few weapons, just expected to fight and die for their betters. Peasants are therefore unreliable but cheap units. They are essentially going to be used just as garrison troops for my castles to keep the population loyalty high in my provinces. And for that reason, they are useful because their, their support cost is cheap. They come in unit sizes of 100 and the population loyalty that is added to a province from each uh, unit is actually linked to the amount of men in that unit. So 100 men will keep the population loyalty higher in a province than a 60 man unit. So they are very, very useful, just not useful on the, bat the battlefield themselves. So if you're finding yourself having to use them on the battlefield, you're kind of in a tough spot. Spearmen. Spearmen are useful in almost any army, particularly against cavalry, and unlike other troop types, the first two ranks can fight thanks to their spears. They aren't likely to stand for long against professional men at arms, but they can give cavalry a nasty shock as long as they hold formation. So as it says, they are made for holding the line, and they are made for specifically holding the line versus cavalry. They will be cut to pieces by um, basically anything with like a sword. Like swords do very well against spears. Swords are designed for killing spears. With that being said, the fact that they have 100 men in the unit makes them quite resilient. So even if they are holding the line against a unit that they have a bad matchup against, like swordsmen, having an extra 40 men will help them hang on for a bit longer. However, however, you see that support cost of 50. That is huge. That is huge. Considering that we are looking at a support cost of 22 for the Gallo Glasses, 15 for the Irish Dartman, and for the Kearns, we're go going up to a 50 support cost for Spearman. Holy crap. And they do only cost 150 uh, Florence to train, which is the same as the Irish Dartman. So... That part's not bad. Actually, wait, it is the same. Yes, it is. Yeah, so that part's fine. But the fact that your support costs, like having a few units. Yeah, in the early game, when your economy is not quite up to speed yet, having some spearmen is really going to drain your resources. So probably that's a unit that you want to kind of wait out on before you're ready to attack. Like, I probably don't want to train any spearmen while I'm consolidating Ireland until I'm ready to actually attack someplace. Then I can train up just a few units of spearmen just for my attack so that my, I'm not draining my economy during that entire build-up phase. So that's going to be the idea there. And as far as my buildings goes, the tech tree in this um, this expansion is very interesting. Uh, let's see, Fortified Village is going to be a village can be fortified with earth ramparts and a timber palisade, making it much more likely to withstand an attack. Well-armed and determined attackers who have even basic siege equipment can cause still cause problems for the defenders. So I think this is just the defense for this. I don't think it... I can't... See, it's a little bit bizarre. It's a little bit strange in this um, expansion. I'm not quite sure. Like the mustard field. This is another really weird one. The mustard field allows men of fighting age to come together and have some very basic training when not aided in the fields. This increases their effectiveness in battle somewhat, but will never turn them into hardened professional soldiers. This allows the training of peasants. And that's it. That's all the mustard field does. For two turns of construction time and then 200 florins, you're just building or being able to train peasants. In addition to that, the mustard field is not even required to build any other buildings. This is not the part, this is not the low rung of a tech tree that allows you to build up to something else. No, no, no. The mustard field is literally just... Two turns of construction time and 200 forms so that you can train peasants somewhere. Now, not completely worthless. As I've described already, I do want to have peasants to garrison my provinces. That is going to be a necessary thing. Also, 
Do I want to train present uh, peasants in Brega, where I have options already to train other better units? No, I don't want to be wasting turns training training peasants here. So yes, building some muster fields is going to be re required as I'm expanding uh, out, just so I can have a you know a closer source of peasants to the front lines. Yeah, so. It's just a weird thing, isn't it? It's just, it's so weird. It's, but it's kind of, I don't know. It's kind of neat. It's kind of a neat little weird thing. So yeah, blacksmith, I think, um, what is this? Uh, enough food from farming allows the society to support full-time specialist artisans. And the blacksmith is one of the first to appear as well as making agricultural tools in a smaller community. The blacksmith is also the maker of weaponry, even when these are simple weapons like spear points. And is that, is he just allowed the training of spearmen? Is is that it? Now this almost feels like it should be a building that gives an attack upgrade to weapons, but that's not the case. The blacksmith is a building that is required so that the armor and the metalsmith can be built. And it is the metalsmith that allows uh, for weapon upgrades to be, to be made. However, metalsmiths uh, do need an iron resource in that province to be built, so I don't think I have that here in Brega. Yeah, there are no resources, but I think I do have some elsewhere, not here in Leg and Ulster. Yeah, Ulster does have the iron deposits, so I could build a metalsmith here in Ulster. They also have gold, which is nice, because that's going to be a good income boost as well once I take Ulster. And yeah, go, keep going through the buildings, Mead Hall. A mead hall is a place where warriors gather, happy to toast the generosity of whichever lord provides the mead. While it lacks the subtle sophistication of cosmopolitan ruler's palace, it is still a place of intrigue among those who seek a ruler's favor. And this is going to be, let's see, upgrade to a royal palace. So I think that's like the main, like, government building, I suppose you could call it. But it also, interesting. So it also allows the training of gallow glasses and Irish dartmen, okay? And then it also gives a valor bonus of plus one. And I believe that's to like any lower tier units. Like I would assume the Kerns and the Spearmen are going to be getting that plus one Valor bonus. Would be my assumption, which is uh, pretty good. So, uh, so yeah, that would yeah that would mean that I can get plus one Valor Kerns from Brega, like right away because I can't train anything here in Legan. Right, right, right. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, basic farms. Yes, this is um. When everyone must work constantly just to feed him or herself, there's no time for people to develop other skills, making trade, society, and even war impossible. Organized farming lifts agriculture above this grinding substance level. And it's just going to generate a little bit of income. Interesting to note, the basic farms in this expansion, this is insane. Construction time, 16 turns. And it's going to cost 1,500 florins to build basic farms. So... You really want to wait until you find the right provinces that are worth that um, that amount of time investment and money investment. That's crazy. That is so much time. And then the Catholic chapel. A chapel is a place of worship that can accommodate a small congregation while not as grand as a church. It still provides the community with spiritual comfort, resulting in a happy and loyal population, a boost to religious faith, and improved morale for troops trained locally. So... As it all said right there, this is a happiness booster. This does boost the happiness of provinces, and it's also going to raise the Catholic religion. Again, not really important for this campaign, but in addition to that, what is important is it's also going to give plus two morale for any troops that are trained here, which is quite good. That's quite important. Then what do we have here? An abbey. Like other religious institutions, an abbey has a beneficial effect on the faith happiness and loyalty of the local people, and it is also a place of learning. Abbeys can become rich and are often the most opulent buildings in a province, making them the targets of greedy and impious raiders, or impious raiders. This, <laughs> this structure is currently generating an annual income of 208. Okay, so it actually makes a bit of money. Interesting. What is interesting about the abbeys, and I just had to actually read this off of the internet, is that it does make the province a target for Viking raiders, which is really fascinating. The, the idea is this. So the construction time, let's go back here, or the construction cost is 2,000 florins for abbeys. Now, typically when you are raiding a province, if you sack a building, you are going to recoup half of that building's construction cost. 
So for an abbey, if I, you know, as the Irish, I'm attacking another faction and were to destroy that faction's abbey, I would get 1,000 forens back. In fact, I could do that to my own abbey. And uh, that would give me a, you know, a quick 1,000 forens boost to my early game. Not a bad idea. I'm not going to do that because that seems a little bit cheesy, but eh, yeah, not a bad consideration, honestly. And it also would take away that target, uh, you know, being for Vikings. Here's the thing. For Vikings, when they sack abbeys, they will recoup that entire... 2,000 florins for destroying that abbey. So that's why they're such a target for Vikings. That's that's really interesting. That's a really cool thing added into this campaign. That's that's really neat. I'm glad I just read that off of the internet. So as far as what I want to build here in Brega, I should probably start right away with watchtowers just because this is a wonderful way. I, I love how in Medieval, as opposed to Shogun, where it takes two turns to bo build border watchtowers, uh, only taking one turn is really, really nice. It just feels really good. So... Getting one of these, they're also really cheap, only cost 100 forms. This is going to boost the population loyalty. In addition to that, this will allow me to spy on neighboring provinces. So that's going to be very good. Um, actually, yeah, for Brega, that's going to allow me to spy on all three of these provinces right away. So that means I don't even need my bishop to like spy in, on Ireland. I guess like right away I could start looking for... Let's see, how do I... Do I can I not leave the islands? Oh yeah, god damn it. Yeah, I don't have a port yet, so I can't even leave leave the island. Hmm. I'm stuck. <laughs> okay, fine. All right, I'll have to build a port at some point. And then, uh, was this Lagan? Yeah, Lagan. What do I want to build here? Like, what's the first thing? A warrior hold, I suppose. It just takes one turn to build, and then 200 forens. Do I want to start with watchtowers though? Like, watchtowers is just so good, just to make sure the population loyalty is good. That seems like a better idea. Because I will be attacking from Lagan immediately, like right now, I think. Declare war. This region is claimed by the rebels who are currently neutral. Do you wish to wage war against them? The rebel faction is led by the men of Munster. Yes. Let's go to war with them, even though I don't know what they have. I will probably just bring everyone that I have from Brega as well. Should I leave anyone behind? The idea is that I will be training a unit right away, and that unit obviously will be available to defend Brega during this end turn, so I essentially could attack with everyone from this province, or do I attack both regions simultaneously? It's a little bit risky, I would say, just because in this case, as you can see, he went from a three-star commander to a four-star commander just through his skilled attacker attribute. That's nice, but as far as this army is concerned, I just have a zero-star captain. Irland, the Black Knee. Yeah, Zeo Stars, not great. He's loyal. He's bias, I'm kind of, but yeah, Zeo Stars. I'm going up against a two star and I have zero vision, I have zero information, zero intelligence on the troop composition here in Connect. So hmm. Yeah, I don't know about that. Maybe Maybe I play this a little bit conservatively and I send like a Kern and a Dartman to Munster to help out with that. I can just leave a Kern back here in Brega to defend. And then while well, that's happening, I can train probably a unit of Gallo Glasses because I don't have any, have any of those uh, up and running quite yet. It does cost 200 Florins, and as far as the support cost goes, it's 22, so it's a little bit more than the other units. And that's going to allow me to be able to defend my province from any potential attacks, you know, during this turn. But I really don't think that's going to happen. The rebels typically are pretty passive, and I'm not at war with the Scots, so I don't think they will be attacking me in my first turn. It's even tempting to attack with just my full force here, going with everyone that I have, just to make sure the job gets done here in Munster. But then they might retreat to Connacht, and then I would have to fight a bigger battle here. But, eh, I don't know. I mean, it's not the worst thing, I suppose. And... Let's make some uh, people governors here. So, Brega is making 424. Actually, let's check my population loyalty. Okay, that's that's okay. Loyalty is 120, and then loyalty is at 100 for Lagan. Okay, so that's that's right on the cusp. I don't want it to go below 100. Um, that's going to be a little bit dicey once it goes there. So, keeping taxes at normal seems good. Want 424 and 4. Oh wow, the income is exactly the same for both provinces. Huh, all right. Population loyalty is 100 for Lagan and then 120 for Brega. So I suppose I could use a governor with maybe a, a little bit of dread for Lagan. What I do like to do, however, I have a requirement, which is that 
I'd like my governors to at least have four acumen. So if I don't have any of those, I'm not going to do it. I'd like to wait. Four acumen, four acumen. Nope, nothing. So I'm probably going to wait. I, I could assign the governorship just to someone just so that they can have it. Um, and then I could use an emissary down the line so that I could strip that person of his title and I could give it to someone more deserving of it. That is an idea. However, getting emissaries in this campaign actually takes a while. It takes like like a third tier governor building, essentially. Like um, I would have to go, it's like Royal Hall, is it? No, I don't know. I, it's, I think it's fort level tech. Like I have to go like fort and then something else before I can train emissaries, which is quite a, quite a bit, honestly. Like that's kind of shocking how hard it is to get emissaries in this campaign, uh, considering that they're actually pretty important. So... I don't really want to assign these governorships willy nilly just to anyone, just just to any guy. Um, I'd rather wait until I can get my four acumen governor. Uh, that that way, they'll these provinces will make the most amount of money that, that I can. So that is going to be the idea there. Brega, so yeah, Brega is training something and building something. Legan is building that watchtower as well. That's looking good. Can I bump up taxes at all? Can I do like high? High is okay. And then just keep Legan at normal, so the population loyalty is good. Legan does have linen here, so this can be used as a trade good once I set up my trade um, economy. But I'm not—I'm quite a—you know—I'm a little—I'm a little ways away from that for now. So, is there anything else really worth looking at? I don't think so. Uh, this is like the factions, uh, diplomacy and alliances uh, page right here. Economy is all right here. So projected profits, I'll be making 740 next turn, um, and I'm starting with 2,000. So. I have a little bit of leeway there. And that's probably it for my very, very long first turn. So let me drop a save and let's get into this battle here. Or I don't even know if they're, yeah, they will retreat. Yeah, that's 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 what I expected. So I conquered Munster without a battle and then I will have to go up to Connacht and fight up there. So Watchtower has been completed here in Lagan and Brega. And signs and portents. Here, terrible portents came about over the land of Northumbria and miserably frightened the people. There were immense flashes of lightning and fiery dragons were seen flying in the air. A great famine immediately followed these signs. However, this was but the start of the troubles for all Britain, as the furious Norsemen came to pillage and lay waste to this fair isle. So how about that? Yeah, the Vikings are coming. Yeah, the Vikings are on their way. Munster, not happy at all, is are they? Let's lower taxes a bit, see if I can fix that up. Wow, yeah, <laughs> loyalty is only hit 55%. Ugh, yikes. Loyalty is 55, yeah, 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 yeah. See, now it's tempting to give this to someone right away, just because the title for Munster will give whatever, whichever governor uh, it is, plus one dread, which will help out with that loyalty. In addition to that, I can build that watchtower, which will help out as well. And I can even send over my unit of gallow glasses that can help out as well. So it went from 65 or 55 to 65 just by adding one 60 man unit over here to Munster. So that's um, going to be pretty good for me. And I, man, it'd be nice. To, uh, yeah. I need to get a port going as fast as possible so that I can send my princess and or my bishop out so that I can talk to the Vikings and try to make some allies here. So, unfortunately, I like to keep my videos within the hour range. I know, super duper slow. I barely got into the actual campaign itself. A lot of just kind of talking about what I'm looking at, the tech tree, the units, the differences between this game and, and the base game and, and all that, you know, all that slow stuff. But I do like to kind of, as I was saying, take the viewer with me and just kind of show you what I'm seeing, because I'm going to be exploring this campaign largely with you, alongside you, because although I have taken a little bit of a peek at it here or there and, you know, played a few turns, played some, I actually started invading the mainland with my initial practice playthrough with this, um, with this faction. But for the most part, there's going to be a lot of an adventure here for me, uh, going into this. So I just want to say, first of all, if you found this channel and you've enjoyed what you're watching, you know, please consider subscribing, dropping a like. I really could use the support and I really do appreciate it as well. If you have any advice for this campaign, the base game for Viking invasion, whatever, I'd love to hear it. I love talking strategy. I love learning more about this game. 
it's super, super fun for me. I really, really enjoy running this channel. So in any case, that is all going to have to wait until next time. As always, I hope you've enjoyed this episode and thank you very much for watching. I've been Conisip playing Medieval Total War Viking Invasion. Thank you very much and goodbye.